Okay, um, so welcome everybody to this uh, uh, workshop on chemology of moduli spaces. Um, so, of course, when we were planning it a year ago, then certainly we were thinking of many people being here. And uh, in the end, it's a combined format. There is some small number of participants uh, on site. There are participants and speakers remotely. Uh, and um, our first speaker is Dimitri Viss, who will be speaking on geometric applications of uh, periodic integration. So, Dmitry, I will now mute myself and give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation to speak here and also for, uh, uh, I said it already, personally to take the, make the effort to organize something during these uh, times and being brave to even organize something in, in real life, not only in virtual space, I think it's, it's great. And, uh, the way to go, and I would have loved to to be with you. Fortunately, uh, I'm myself uh, in quarantine uh, right now, but I feel great. I don't think this is just a, a precaution. So about the mathematics, as you said, uh, there will be two parts. I will start giving some geometric applications of periodic integration that are uh, basically no uh, none of my results. Uh, and then in the second part, we talk about uh, we'll talk about uh, moduli spaces of Higgs bundles and applications there. So the first part will be slides. The second part will be on on a tablet. And so I apologize. Some of you may have already seen very similar slides uh, 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 in previous talks. So maybe if you're remotely watching and saw them already, you you can also phase off a little bit. But uh, OK, let me start. Uh, so in this first part, sort of the, the motivating result, we're trying to understand this, uh, this theorem of Batyarev, why uh, smooth projective birational Calabiao varieties have the same uh, Betty numbers or, or Hodge numbers, as we, as we will see. And uh, uh, to prove this, one, one needs to, to introduce quite a few uh, exotic, if you like, uh, objects. So we'll look at uh, what an analytic man manifolds over some uh, complete valued field or non-Archimedean field. Then in talk about integration over these and, uh, and something that's called the canonical measure on smooth varieties. And uh, actually, because of the format, so the overview is not quite complete. And <clears throat> we'll also have some slides on uh, on singular algebraic varieties and, and what what one can do there and what to expect from this uh, theory uh, there. And maybe if uh, if this sounds very <clears throat> vague, I should say by reading the other abstracts also that if I talk about periodic integration, one could also, you may also think of some sort of uh, loop space, uh, integration over loop spaces or, or arc spaces. So I think it's in spirit, not so far from, from other people's talks uh, at, at the conference. Um, so let's start with the notion of an analytic manifold. So it's quite elementary in principle. So you, you can take any field with an absolute value and develop a basic theory of, of analytic manifolds on it. So F could be the real numbers, uh, it could be uh, periodic numbers, it could but also be a power series, uh, a Laurent, field of Laurent series, for example. And then uh, you simply set an analytic function to be uh, <clears throat> locally given by, by a convergent power series uh, with respect to this norm that you have on your field. And then a manifold, in general, exclude from uh, from open subsets of uh, of, uh, of an n-dimensional vector space over the field such that the transition functions are uh, themselves analytic, and you get some some theory, basic some basic differential geometry as you know it for the real numbers. So, in particular, for these uh, analytic functions, you also have uh, an inverse function theorem, 
which is um, and just it's really a statement about some formal statement about power series more mostly and uh, and this as a uh, differential geometry gives you lots of examples for us the the main example will of course come from algebraic geometry where uh, when if you take any uh, finite type scheme over this uh, valued field you can look first at the smooth locus of, of, of uh, that scheme and then the f valued points of the smooth locus and this is some set but it is locally cut out by by smooth equations and so you by the inverse function theorem you, you can find charts on this manifold and, and this defines you then a manifold and uh, on these manifolds one one can then integrate and uh, this however requires some more assumption in this theory so we will need uh, our valued field to to we take a non-archimedean uh, and local meaning that it's either a finite extension of qp or fp uh, loro series over a finite field and the the reason for for that is that we need the this residue field to be to be finite uh, as we will see in a bit so i just wrote down some notations so we always have the ring of integers which will just be the elements of norm less than or equal to one um, so that would be zp inside qp we have the maximal ideal which would be the, the ideal generated by by the prime p or the parameter t and um, we have this residue field, which will for us be a finite field, uh, FQ. Always. And uh, so the absolute value uh, the, the, since any norm, uh, any norm, any uniformizer has absolute value Q, Q inverse. And um, since the residue field is, is, is finite, the, um, our space is locally compact and we have a hard measure on, uh, on it, which we denote by mu. And then we normalize it so that the ring of integers has, has norm one. So this is what you cannot do if you say you would take uh, the Laurent series over the complex numbers. That will not be locally compact. Um, and so uh, and so there's no hard measure. And this would then lead to, to what is called motivic integration instead of, of piadic integration. Um, it's one way to remedy it. But anyway, we're not not going to go too much into into this motivic uh, setting for, for this talk just to to give you a feeling of this harm a very uh, rough idea of this harm measure um, so this uh, translation invariance under addition it it almost determine i mean it determines it completely essentially so you can uh, decompose the ring of integers into translates uh, uh, of the maximal ideal for each element in the residue field, you get one translate. And so you see that, uh, so now you apply the measure on both sides and you will see that Q times the measure of, of the maximal ideal will be will be one. And so the, and then, so you can compute these things. So the units would, for example, then be the complement of the maximal ideal and the measure is one minus Q inverse. And so for, uh, for other sets, you can sort of always locally cover them by, by small balls. And so it's a very sort of combinatorial kind of measure. And, um, and with this measure, we can integrate uh, forms now. So if you, have, if you take some analytic manifold, just, just as in the real case, we take uh, an n form, so top dimensional form, and then um, you obtain a measure by, by integrating this form locally. But there is some slight, so I say integrate the form, but there is some, some asymmetry with the real case here is that uh, even though we work over some non-Archimedean field F, the measure are still real valued. They don't, so they don't take values in, in the field F we're working on. And so we cannot integrate uh, F valued functions or differential forms but we need something real valued and that's what we that's why we take the absolute value of the measure so locally your form you write it uh, it's a function times the the standard form 
and then you just integrate the absolute value of, of that form. And again, so this is, is a definition you can make, and it's not uh, it's not too difficult to see that that this gives you a well-defined measure. Namely, uh, there is something called the, the change of variables formula in the, in this periodic setting, and I I wrote it down. I think it's very it's again very funny that it it's exactly the same uh, formula as in the real in the real case. And instead, you also take the absolute value of the Jacobian that describes the, the change of measure. Um, and so this gives you a, an integration theory on, on, on analytic manifolds. And now we will go to to the main uh, to the manifolds that we're interested in. That that come from smooth uh, algebraic varieties. So we uh, assume we have uh, X smooth, but not, not only over the field, but we would like it smooth over the ring of integers. So basically this means that also you, your variety is given by some equations over the, this ring of integers. And, um, and if you reduce mod P, you get a variety over a finite field and you still want that variety over the finite field to be smooth as well. Uh, okay, then separated finite type, some dimension n. And then we, we, we have two manifolds we can associate with, uh, with x. So these are the, the integer valued points and uh, the f valued points of the field. And we, since uh, x is separated, we can think of one as being inside the other, basically. So, uh, uh, and uh, so in general, this will be a strict, strict inclusion. If you think of like just the X, you take X to be A1, then you just get the inclusion of the, the integers into, the, into the, the whole field. But if, um, but if X, if you choose X to be proper, then you can see um, that basically any, uh, any F point of your, uh, of your scheme over, uh, over O will extend to an O point. And so then you, if, if X is proper, you get an equality. Then these two things are, are, are the same, but in general, we restrict to this uh, O, o valued uh, points because that will be a compact manifold in this, uh, in this analytic sense. And so it, uh, we expect measures to be finite and so on. And so the measure is, is, is constructed as follows. Uh, you just, you just uh, cover your space by some so risk, so choose some Zariski covering that trivializes the, the canonical sheaf. So sections of the canonical sheaf are exactly top dimensional forms. And you choose um, on, each, uh, on each chart uh, a trivializing section. Um, so there's a section that doesn't vanish anywhere on this chart. And then uh, what happens is that on two, if you so you choose them arbitrary, but on the intersection, you will have two forms that um, differ by a function, which which is invertible. But um, and so here, sort of comes the the, the little piadic twist or the non-Archimedean twist, is that the the units in, in the ring of integers they have norm one, and so. The, the, the two functions coming from omega i or omega j, they just, they give you the same, uh, I mean, the, their absolute value is the same. And so you get a, a well-defined, uh, so integrating these forms on the patches gives you a well-defined measure on the space, which we call uh, the canonical the canonical measure. And so, uh, and so this doesn't depend on, on anything. Which is a, which is kind of a nice, a nice construction. So just to to make this even more uh, more explicit, you could, for example, take uh, some elliptic curve. So say uh, the affine part of, of, of an elliptic curve, then the manifold will literally just live in the. So it would just be pairs of of, of periodic integers, satisfying um, the defining equation of the elliptic curve. And so this then will have uh, the structure of an analytic manifold by, by the inverse function theorem. And we can actually choose a global, 
algebraic uh, one form on this space uh, by this formula and then so we and then you can integrate that and you can ask uh, uh, what is uh, what is this uh, what what's the value of this integral so maybe i should have said so in the case that the um, the canonical bundle is trivial globally then you you can just choose a trivial trivializing section globally and integrate and integrate that and and the answer to what this uh, this integral is is given by wales theorem so wales uh, wales theorem tells you that essentially what you you're doing if you take the, the volume of your uh, analytic manifold you get uh, you simply get the number of points of the of the special fiber of, of, of the scheme up to a correction of, up to a power of q uh, so in some sense you haven't gained anything so you so you don't learn anything new than that you already knew from from the finite field so in fact the, the theorem is not is not terribly difficult what you just have to notice is that you have some sort of restriction map so this is just taking a solution taking a taking a point in x mod p gives you a restriction map uh, which is surjective by by smoothness of uh, that's where we use smoothness so you can always uh, lift a solution of your equations in the finite field to a solution in the completed field that is a uh, this Hensel's lemma, and then uh, and then you show that if you just have a, a point over uh, of x over the the finite field, then uh, if you take its inverse, it will. The idea is that it looks some sort of like a, a ball. So if you think of x as affine space, then it will just be all the elements. Uh, so you think of affine space and little x to be the origin, then the, all the elements restricting to that point will be the elements that live in the maximal ideal to the power n, and um, and you get you can actually for any smooth scheme you can make some sort of an analytic analytic isomorphism that preserves the Jacobian. And so, as we saw from the example, the maximal ideal had volume one over q, and so this this gives this here by summing up. So we haven't really gained anything in some sense but uh, but there is no, nonetheless this curious observation that if you now take a, a closed uh, closed sub scheme inside x uh, which will then necessarily so proper closed sub scheme of smaller dimension then the, if you just look at the the o points that lie in this sub scheme they will have volume zero so it looks like you can sort of uh, disregard uh, certain bad loci of, of, your, of your scheme x you're interested and in, still get the whole number of points if you're able to, to construct the, the volume, uh, in, in a, to compute the volume. And this gives, uh, as we will see in a minute, this will give us some flexibility in computing uh, these integrals as opposed to, to, to counting points sort of in, in discrete way. Um, yeah, and so maybe to come back to this idea of loop spaces, to one way to think about uh, about this is somehow to to think of this this space of O points of your variety X as uh, as so as an arc space. So Right, so the spectrum of of O, this is a is a DVR, so it will have a closed point and an open point, and the and so the the open point you think of sort of of of, uh, of an arc that is based at the the closed point, and so what this um, this analytic manifold is is really the space of arcs that probes uh, your variety. And um, and so now this this remark it just says that you have lots and lots of arcs, and you can sort of um, throw away certain arcs that uh, that maybe lie that lie sort of entirely in a bad locus of your scheme. 
So it doesn't mean that you don't see the bat locus because you could still have an arc that is sort of based in the bad locus, but then sort of goes out of it. So the, the generic fiber goes out of it. So you sort of see everything of X, but the, the fact that you have this arc space, it gives you some gives you some flexibility. So it's a good good way of probing a space is to look at the arcs that, that live inside it somehow. So that's a, it's maybe a more geometric way to, to think about this, this construction. And so now we are uh, in already in good shape to to come back to to Bat-Dürer's theorem. So we have uh, two smooth and projective uh, birational Calabi-Aus, and we want to show that they have the same uh, Betty numbers. And for me, Calabi-Aus, it's so it just means that the, the canonical bundle is trivial. Which, uh, which is convenient because this for us, it will tell us that we can choose sort of globally a, um, a, a top, a volume form or a gauge form on X. And um, so this is not enough. There is uh, some geometric input to prove, uh, to prove this theorem, which says uh, the following. So it says that if you have uh, X and Y, two birational, uh, uh, so uh, this birational map between the Calabi-Aus, then, um, then there exists uh, open subsets uh, U and V, open sub varieties. On, so the max, yes. Uh, was it a question or just the microphone? I think. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay, so you have a birational map. Uh, you think you think there was a question? No, no. I think that's uh, that, that's fine. From time to time, this mic maybe plays some small games, but no. Up to now, it worked very smoothly. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, so this lemma. So we have a birational map between smooth projective Calabi-Aus varieties. And um, the statement is that we can find sort of open sets, open sub varieties U and V, where, where F is uh, is defined completely. Both uh, both have uh, and ah, so the, the main point is so there's these are these maximum sets where F is defined, and the statement is that their complements have codimension at least two. Okay, and uh, in fact, I, I have a small, very naive question. So in this theorem, right? But they still have the same dimension or or something, right? Because you, you you're saying that uh, they are birational. This I, I assume that, right? You, you kind of this would be the statement about Betty numbers of Calabi-Aus of the same dimension. Is it is it right? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I think if you're birational, you have to have the same dimension. Because just you need to be an isomorphism on, on some open. Um, so, so okay. So the, the statement of the lemma is that you can always extend to to on co-dimension one. And basically, the 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 idea is that you, first you're proper, so you can always sort of uh, proper and smooth. So you can always extend the map F somehow to to a divisor in in X. And then the Calabiao condition, it, it will imply that F cannot contract um, that divisor. And then so it so F extends sort of on X, and then you can play the same game with uh, in the other direction to get this, this lemma. And okay, so at some point one has to find the connection between uh, between uh, this statement about Betty numbers and uh, and like uh, piadic or finite fields and piadic fields and so on. And this is uh, this is sort of by now a standard technique which is I mean is quite deeply rooted in uh, in et al cohomology, the whale conjectures and, and so on. Um, which says that so you can start with your schemes X and Y over the complex numbers, and then you can spread them out. Basically, you just 
build up some algebra over the integers that contains all the coefficients necessary to define x and y. And then once you spread out, then you can specialize to, to various finite fields. So you can look at morphisms from this, this algebra to, <clears throat> to finite fields. And, um, and then if you can somehow show that, so, so and then various properties like properness, or if you have a morphism, a birational morphism, all this will extend to the spreading out. And then if you can show that the two varieties now over finite fields have the same number of points for sufficiently many finite fields, then this will imply the equality of, of Betty numbers uh, of the, the varieties over the, the complex numbers. Um, uh, Dimitri, again, a naive question. How, how is it? Is it because you can read the Betty numbers from the uh, behavior of uh, those number of points as a function of Q? Is it right? Uh, yes, yes. So that's the, uh, that's the idea. So then, of course, the, the behavior of these numbers in Q can be, can be very complicated. So it's really, it's really more about, uh, so it's, it's sort of, an, uh, so the number of points over a finite field, they would be governed by, by the tal homology and the action of, of Frobenius on the tal homology. And sort of uh, the statement that they have the number of points for, for these uh, various uh, finite fields will tell you that sort of the homology uh, are isomorphic as Galois representations. And then there is a comparison between a tal homology and the usual singular homology, which then tells you that over, over the complex numbers also this uh, sort of, uh, at least in the Grothendieck group, somehow the homologies are isomorphic. And, and so, I mean, just the additive invariants of your, of your homology are, are the same. So, but, but yes, if you, uh, so there's this nice, so if you, if it happens that the number of points would be something like a, or just a polynomial in Q, then from that polynomial, you can indeed uh, read off uh, uh, the, the Betty numbers in the case for smooth and projective varieties, yes. Um, so that's how you go from complex numbers to, to finite fields. And then you can, uh, and then you can sort of either from the spreading out, or you can just add a formal variable t in this, uh, if you don't think about Piadic fields, but this uh, Laurent series field, you can just introduce this, this formal variable t and then talk about volumes of x and y. So over, over O, over this ring of integers uh, that, we, that we saw earlier. So that means we can further assume that uh, x and y are, are defined over the ring of integers and they're still smooth, uh, projective Calabiao and birational, but now everything over this ring of integers. And um, then uh, by Well's theorem, we are now reduced to, compure, uh, to compare the, the volumes of these two, these two guys. And now we will use the, the extra uh, flexibility the volume gives us. So first, as I said, <clears throat> there is uh, this global volume form that we can use to, to compute the canonical measure. So we just need to integrate its uh, absolute value. And um, the lemma will tell us that if you pull back this volume form along the, the birational map F, it will, still ex it will still extend to a volume form on, on X because uh, it, cannot, it, can nowhere, it can, can never vanish because it would vanish on a divisor. But f is an isomorphism up to co-dimension two. So, so we have that, and then finally, um, we we know that on the level of f points. So now you just look at u and v. So basically, the complements on u of v will now be these closed uh, subsets from the remark we saw earlier. So on on the f points of u and v, we have an isomorphism. I, uh, from F and by proper by properness now of X and Y, um, we see that any, you take any F point of U 
it will extend to some O point of X. So it's not something. Uh, so here that's really because of properness that we can always uh, sort of, so this, in some sense, this means that any arc has to have a limit. So if you take, a, or any loop, that any loop should have a limit uh, by properness. Uh, and uh, the complement, what are the complements of, of this, uh, this, or this set U of F inside X of O? Well, these are exactly the, um, the arcs that lie entirely in the complement of, uh, of U inside X. So they lie entirely in a complement which is closed as a smaller dimension and therefore measure zero. And so this observation gives you the first and the last equality. And uh, the equality in the middle is just by the change of variables formula. So you can, of course, uh, uh, that's just how you pull back forms and how the integral transforms on the pullback. So you see that the canonical measures agree. And so the number of points agree. And so in, in final conclusion, the, the Betty numbers uh, agree. Okay. So um, maybe uh, uh, Dimitri, we now see some, some uh, no, I think, we, I think we see emails on the computer. Uh, j j just a sec, we, oh, it's our computer. yeah, it's our computer. I think. Oh, okay. Oops. Oh, Green button, not that one, the other one. Oh. Green, that one. Very strange. Wow. But do you use something here? No. No, but it's anyways, it's the other computer. Yeah, sorry, we had some small small problem with how how we see it on the screen but now it's fixed okay great thanks uh, so okay so that was uh, how uh, a way to prove Bateria's theorem with um, yeah it seems a bit like cheating but that's that's how 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 this theory works um uh, so a few remarks so Yes, uh, the, the, there is there, there is a question. So you, you have sound on your computer, or you, yes, you have no, to, no, 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 no. You 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 uh, have, have to speak to this thing. Yeah, you have you have to speak to uh, at least to some mic. This is this is not working now. Uh, that, okay. That's for a different thing. Okay. Yeah, tell us. Yeah. So the question, as you pointed out, so so you said there, it feels a little bit like cheating, but that's how this works. That's a that's a quote from from you. So. Um, <laughs> So I was just wondering, just can you repeat one, one more time? Because you see, well, it's obvious where the cheating is. You just, so uh, uh, roughly, we, we say, we know that the, the number of points of our finite fields, uh, so, so, so we, are, we are saying that the number of points of finite fields is the same uh, uh, for these X and Y. So I, I would need to let him speak, uh, you see? And, and, and then, uh, and then based on that, we are proving this or uh, somehow, or it is possible that the number of points of finite fields is not the same, but nevertheless, the, the uh, integral remains the same because the co-dimension is large. Or... Uh, no, it, so it is true that the number of points are the same over, the, over, uh, over a finite field, but somehow, uh, so the, I think the, the point is that the map F, it does not induce, uh, I mean, it doesn't induce a bijection between the, the number of points, right? Because uh, F is not defined everywhere. So, I mean, if you take a, fine, a point that lies outside the, the locus of definition of F, there's no way to control where, where it goes. So F, so, so that's exactly the point somehow that the, so F is not an isomorphism between these discrete sets. But one can think of F, in, F will induce an isomorphism of the, of the analytic manifolds of X and Y up to measure zero. So it, this is sort of, a, sort of a weaker notion of equivalence, but these, um, 
but these analytic manifolds up to measure zero, they, they know about the, the number of points. That's, uh, so you cannot say F induces any, there's no way to, to find a bijection between this finite set of points, but sort of the, the spaces of arcs that converge to all these points, they are isomorphic. Thanks a lot. Still, it sounds as a very, very strong statement that the number of points is the same as, as I understand for all Qs or for many, many Qs, right? Yes, for for well, not all, but finite. But you can so for, so for all characteristics p up up to finitely many, and then up to all powers of of those p. So yeah, basically almost all. That's, uh, that's true. Uh, okay, let me, so interrupt me if there are more questions, but let me say a, a few remarks. So I mentioned already uh, motivic integration. And so this result was actually the, the starting point or the motivation for Kontsevich to, to, to come up with this theory, which is an analog, but instead of uh, integrating over Piadic numbers you integrate you integrate over um, over sort of power series uh, points with values in power series over the complex numbers of your scheme. So that's a way to not at all go to to finite fields and all that. And uh, and then, but as as I mentioned, the the problem becomes that. Uh, the, the residue field is not algebraically closed, so algebraically closed, so you don't have a measure in the traditional sense, but you replace it with sort of the motivic measure of a, of a scheme which just associates to a scheme its class in the cross and ring of varieties. And uh, and then it's another other work of Deline basically on on Hodge numbers on mixed Hodge structures that then from this class in the cross and ring you can not only recover the Betty numbers, but actually the Hodge numbers of your uh, of your variety. So actually, X and Y have have. So the strongest statement is somehow X and Y have the same class in some completed cross and ring of varieties. And then from that you deduce that X and Y have the same uh, Hodge numbers, which uh, later, interestingly, you can already deduce from uh, from the original argument of of Batyarev. So you can, uh, by using some piadic Hodge theory, you can show that the equality of the number of points already uh, implies an equality of Hodge numbers. Uh, once again, and uh, and finally, and and, this, and then so for a long time, this is kind of curious. This was the only way of of, of getting, which is quite a, quite a general statement, and the only way of proving it. Was we had this trick using arc spaces in some way. And so MacLean showed in, uh, there's a preprint, but now it's two years old, I guess, uh, that X and Y in this situation have something uh, equivalent um, quantum small quantum cohomology, which I uh, admit I don't quite fully understand what it means, but at least I think one can recover the Betty numbers from, from, the, from this uh, small quantum cohomology. And so this gives a sort of completely different proof of the of the same uh, theorem, but uh, it's it's to me it's very interesting. So there's other instances where this uh, piadic theory parallels sort of symplectic uh, symplectic geometry, and there are some other formulas uh, of DNF and, and Lezer that resemble a lot. Uh, uh, I think formulas in in Fleur homology. And uh, this is, is kind of a mystery to, to me, but so uh, on, on some philosophical level, I feel like this, this integration theory, it, it is sort of complementary to usual uh, cohomological methods that you use to, to study any mani manifolds or, or, or algebraic varieties. So it sort of picks up on something that you cannot quite see with usual say singular cohomology and i think if there were some sort of cohomology theory that resembles this piadic integration one should look in this 
corner of mathematics, symplectic geometry, fleur, fleur homology, and so on. But I cannot, I cannot make this precise. I just it's a feeling that that, that I have. And so, uh, in the remaining five to ten minutes, I uh, would like to say something about uh, the singular case. Uh, uh, so what happens? So not completely singular, but if if x is not smooth anymore, but x has sort of orbifold singularities, then uh, the theory is also is, is very satisfying, uh, I think. So so formally we would take a smooth and tame and delete Mumford stack, which is you, sh you could think of as something like a smooth scheme with a group act, finite group action on it. And then there is a map which goes from this stack to the coarse moduli space, which just, would just be the usual geometric quotient of the scheme by the finite group. And we assume that sort of generically, there are no stabilizers so that X is already generically a scheme. And so this open, and then set u inside x. So curly u will map isomorphically to some open and then set inside the coarse moduli space uh, straight x, which is um, which is an orbifold. And then now the O points of x will not have the structure of it. So it will be singular, so we will not have the structure of a of an analytic manifold, but uh, it doesn't matter. Sort of we can just throw away the, the singular locus and we look at that manifold. So we look at the uh, the manifold which is the intersection of all the, the the arcs inside our space such that the generic points of those arcs they lie in this U. That's the locus where, where X is smooth. And so and so then as before I don't want to go into in too much detail one constructs a measure sort of canonically again on, on this space. So this is orbifold measure. And we can again ask the question, what is the, the volume? So it's something canonical associated to, to, to an orbifold. Uh, and the answer is this theorem, which sort of goes back to the Neflezer and then really worked out by Yazuda and, and, and uh, myself with Michel Greshenik and, and Paul Ziegler. So we use this formula quite a bit which says that basically the, the total volume of this orbifold, it sees not the number of points of X, of the, the stack X, but the number of points of the inertia stack of, of X. So there is, so what's the, the inertia stack? The inertia stack is just the pairs of elements in your stack together with, with an automorphism. And, um, and then we count the number of points in a weighted way. So there's this weight function. Uh, so that's the sort of the weighted point count. But basically, this is a long -quality constant function. So the inertia stack will have sort of different components. And on each component, this weight function should be is constant. So it's just some correction factor. And so this formula, curiously, has like an enormous amount of, of applications. I think, well, enormous, I don't know, but it appears uh, a lot. So, so maybe uh, given the time, let me skip this. Uh, this. This slide was explaining how to to prove the theorem. Maybe just give give uh, an application uh, that I that I like, and uh, not. I mean, I understand, but I think there's maybe also more to it. So one one way to get a sort of uh, an orbifold is to you start with something which is smooth, uh, smooth scheme overall, and then you consider the um, symmetric power, symmetric product of of that smooth scheme. So you divide by the symmetric group that that is a, that is an orbifold, and the stack would just be the stack quotient of this, and then so this comes with an orbifold measure, and you can compute. This very this is a, an easy exercise. You just need to understand the inertia stack of the symmetric products, and it's purely combinatorial in terms of uh, uh, in terms of permutations. And so, in particular, the inertia stack will have components indexed by by partitions, and the and the, the pieces so corresponding to partition is just this product of smaller 
symmetric product. So these are these X alphas. And the weight function we can also can also uh, determine directly. And then so you get this formula. So this is for this is completely general, right? So for any X, any smooth scheme, you have such a formula. Um, but you can do more. So in the case when you take a surface now, two-dimensional scheme, then you have a this famous crep and resolution of, of the symmetric uh, product given by the Hilbert scheme. And, um, and then you, you get some, something interesting. So the fact, so first of all, the Hilbert scheme is smooth itself. So the volume on the Hilbert scheme, it will again reproduce uh, the number of points up to this factor q to the 2n, which is the dimension. And then the fact that the, the resolution is crepant it uh, will tell you that the volume, so crep and resolutions are volume preserving, basically. So crep and means that uh, the pullback of the canonical bundle is still the canonical bundle. So if you have a global section downstairs, which is what this orbifold measure is defined by, if you pull it back, you still get the global measure upstairs. So as in, so sort of this is similar to, to, to Batir, so this function f in Batyrev theorem, which took one volume form to another volume form. And the fact that, so since it's a resolution, uh, this is a proper map. And so again, on the level of analytic manifolds, this proper map will induce an isomorphism. And so you see that uh, the number of points of the Hilbert scheme is the volume of the Hilbert scheme is the volume of the symmetric product. And the volume of the symmetric product, we can compute using this orbifold formula and it uh, just matches uh, Kutch's formula for the, so in this case, number of points, but you could also take uh, Letty numbers or Hodge numbers, and, or you can even motivically take motifs and you always get, get this formula. And what I find very curious, so let me stop with this remark, is that uh, in this, uh, in this uh, approach to Kutch's formula, somehow what, what gives you the combinatorics is this inertia stack of the symmetric products, as opposed to say it's a localization with respect to a C star action that gives you the, the formula. And I think this, I find this very curious and I, I think it's an interesting train of thoughts to, to, to somehow try to make the symmetric products or the inertia stack uh, appear differently in, with respect to Hilbert schemes, but I don't, I don't quite know yet uh, why. So it's some, some funny, some funny fact that I think uh, one could uh, could investigate uh, in the future. But that's the end of the first part. So thanks for all the Um So are there any questions uh, on site or remote? If uh, remote people have questions, you can just unmute yourself and ask. But uh, uh, on site, you should probably tell me. So as I whatever manage the this. So Andres, do you want to? But you 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 I, I can if you you would need to to use my mic. Go ahead. Yeah, so are there some very simple singularities that are not orbifold where we can do something? Um, okay, can I, okay, you can hear me. So, so in some sense, uh, it's, it's, so you can always, whatever singular space you have, if you have a differential form on it, a volume, not a volume form, but some differential form, Top dimensional, you can integrate it on the smooth local, on, on the way we do it on, on this uh, sort of on the arcs that generically lie in the smooth locus. Okay, and if you're lucky, that gives you some some number. And uh, sometimes it will be infinite, but nonetheless, you can always express this in terms of a resolution of this of the singular space. So the idea is that you will re so if you resolve the singularities, you get something smooth. And then you have to, of course, pull back that form you chose 
to to start with and um and that form it will have poles it, along the these exceptional divisors of the resolution it will have zeros and poles but uh basically if you if you give me all this data on how the form pulls back um etc the point that it's a resolution it will still tell you that uh, on the level of uh analytic manifolds, it is basically up to measure zero when isomorphism. And then I can now, and so you can, so what I'm saying is you can always on a resolution compute the volume of any singularity. And um, the problem in general, okay, so that gives you, in some sense you can do something, but of course a resolution of a singularity in general is not, I mean, you need to know it, it's usually some obscure uh, it's some obscure data that is not so clear to to access. But if you have a resolution, then then you know the the volume. 